This is CBC Here and Now. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain in self-isolation. A sad milestone during this pandemic, the province's first death because of COVID-19. Let's get right to tonight's top story. COVID-19 has claimed its first life in this province. The man died late yesterday. Here now is Peter Cowan is live from the newsroom. So Peter, what can you tell us about the person who died? Because of privacy reasons, officials are being very careful about just how much information they release. For example, they're not saying what community this man was from, uh, only saying that it, he was in the Eastern Health region. But there are a few details that we can tell you about. So, for example, we do know that he is 78 years old uh, and did have an underlying medical condition. We're told his condition deteriorated fairly rapidly. He was in hospital for less than two days before his death. And his case is linked to the cluster of cases that we've seen from Call's funeral home. Here's what the Premier had to say this afternoon. As we see the first death of a resident of our province due to complications of COVID-19 virus, we now have a family in our province who is grieving and impacted at the greatest extent due to this virus. As I said yesterday, this is not where we want to be today. This is never where we want to be. Not today, not tomorrow, not into the future. So I want to take this moment to pass along my deepest condolences to the family of the gentleman, a man who undoubtedly will be greatly missed by his family and his friends. Now the number of cases continues to rise. Uh, take a look at the latest numbers. There were 13 new cases today, all in that eastern region. So if you're checking the total, that brings us up to 148 people who have the disease. And 75% of all of those are all tied in with Call's funeral home. We also found out today about some new restrictions. So for example, funerals and wakes of any size are now banned. Weddings are limited to just five people. That's down from 10 and stores can no longer sell any lottery tickets. So that includes break open or scratch tickets. With this death, it highlighted the need again for physical distancing. It was a theme that we've seen through many of these news conferences, although the Premier admitted today that's going to be very difficult as a family tries to grieve. With emotion comes a want to be able to console one another, maybe with a hug or provide a shoulder to cry on. It's our human nature. But we are in different times, a time where our loving and our kind touch can do more damage than good. Now, one good piece of good news. In oh, we lost Peter there. Sorry about that. But uh, I think the good news that Peter was referring to that we have seen some cases uh, of patients who have fully recovered. I think that number uh, is around seven. Uh, so that is some good news. Well, moving on now, uh, tonight we're hearing from one family affected by COVID-19. Mike Meany has a family member in his household who tested positive. Now, that person came in contact with someone who had visited Call's funeral home. Meany says the rest of his household has been tested negative and his sick family member is recovering, but he does have a message for everyone. A couple days went by and symptoms started to increase and a little bit of fever and things like that. So decided to make a call back and that's when things sprung into action and then we got the positive test about 24 hours later. So uh, the rest of us in the household had to be tested. Thankfully, they all came back uh, negative. The family members on the men now and starting to turn the other way. So we're, we're certainly happy about that. We're not out of the woods yet. We still have to stay inside the house. Can't go anywhere. Uh, still allowing this family member to just use the only washroom we have uh, upstairs while the rest of us continue to use downstairs. I guess it just shows how quickly this can spread and people, if you have any doubt whatsoever, just stay away. And, and, and the best advice I can say is do what we've been doing. Wash your hands frequently, wipe down all your common areas, stay, stay, stay your distance from each other and just stay safe, stay home. 
Well, an employee at Sobeys on Topsail Road has tested positive for COVID-19. It was an employee in the pharmacy at that location. On its website, Sobeys says the employee hasn't worked since last Thursday, March 26th. Public health officials have recommended that all pharmacy employees stay home and self-isolate. Sobe says, quote, we have completed a deep clean and sanitized the store. With the province's first COVID-19 death and a growing number of cases in the St. John's area, some people in Labrador think travel within the province now needs to be reconsidered. Anthony joins me from his home where he remains in self-isolation. So Anthony, what are the concerns about travel between the island and Labrador? Well, Carol, today's uh, you know sad news to say the least about our first death in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. There have been people in Labrador have been raising concerns about the fact that we've seen this virus get closer to Labrador. We have the virus in St. Anthony now, and the logic is basically this: at first, the province was saying to people coming to the island, at least, if you've been on international flights and you get here, you have to self-isolate for 14 days. As this pandemic got more serious, we saw the province change that policy so that if you were flying here from Prince Edward Island or New Brunswick or Quebec or any other province, you also had to self-isolate. So a lot of people in the big land basically taking the logic, if you have to self-isolate, that makes it safer no matter where you are from. And one of the people talking about this is Ron Barron, the mayor of Wabush, who is saying not only should all flights from St. John's and the island have passengers who self-isolate, but maybe it should extend to travel in Labrador itself. It's just frustrating that when you see... Uh what's transpiring across the country uh, and here locally in our own province that we're not making these measures, taking these measures further to make sure that we don't have any uh, spread of this community spread or whatever uh, so we can get through this without being uh, infected, affected by this virus. So the thinking is if you can imagine a plane leaving St. John's because from the point of view of looking at the province, the glowing red epicenter for our province is the St. John's area, certainly the eastern area. That plane takes off from St. John's, lands in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then people will disperse from there to their other locations. So people in those locations thinking that maybe we should actually take this a little more seriously and actually have this kind of isolation. Now, this was a subject which came up for the minister who's responsible for Labrador, and that's Premier Dwight Ball. We do have both the RNC and the Quebec Police, uh, the Vermont uh, Labrador West border as well. So right now it's stressing essential travel only. Uh, only when necessary should you travel outside of Lab West into other areas of Labrador or into the province. Okay, so Anthony, we started this off by talking about Wabush, but what about other communities in Labrador? Well, I got in touch with Happy Valley Goose Bay, and I think it's fair to say that town is lukewarm on the idea. They're not quite sure how uh, smaller communities in Labrador would actually enforce this sort of self-isolation. We've seen problems here in St. John's with that, Carolyn, as you well know. And then, of course, there are the indigenous communities in Labrador, which have taken fairly strict uh, policies. Natwashish, for example, if you leave, uh, you're not going to be allowed back. Most of the indigenous communities for the, the Innu Nation and uh, no, but for the Inuit, they have taken very, very strict policies. So they, they already think of themselves as being self-contained. But certainly, this is a topic that's not going to go away in Labrador, particularly if we see more and more cases. This might remain on the political agenda, and we'll probably be talking about this again. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Anthony. Well, it's clear that this pandemic is grinding our economy to a halt. The latest industrial site in this province to begin sending its employees home is the North Atlantic Oil Refinery in Come By Chance. Terry Roberts joins us now with more. So Terry, what's the impact of this? Yeah, well, Carolyn, this is quite significant because from what I can gather, North Atlantic is the first oil refinery in North America to actually stop making fuels, but I'm hearing they probably will not be the last. That's because the oil industry has been really been hit hard on two fronts uh, as we speak. Of course, we all know about the COVID-19 pandemic, and as a result of that, the demand for many types of fuels that we use in society, well, it's practically seized up. And I'm an example of that myself. I haven't started my own personal vehicle in about a week and a half. And also we have Russia and Saudi Arabia. Well, they're in a bit of a feud, two major oil producing companies. They're flooding the market right now with oil. So the price of a barrel of Brent crude, now that's the benchmark, but that's so important to our economy. The last I checked, that was below $23 a barrel. So it's clear it's just not economically viable right now to continue 
operating the Combine Chance oil refinery. And uh, that also raises another question because North Atlantic supplies many of the fuels that we use in this province, everything from gasoline to propane and jet fuel. So is there a threat to our fuel supply? So we asked the question today of Premier Dwight Ball during his regular daily briefing. The inventory that they have in place for propane, which they supply 100% of the propane to the province. There is inventory available to support them through this, this time. Also around jet fuel, they supply 100% of the jet fuel to the province. There is an inventory of that. They are not the only provider of gasoline. And speaking to the other provider, we, uh, uh, we're now checking on the amount of inventory that would be acquired, but there is substantial inventory. So Terry, how are the employees at the refinery reacting to all of this? Yeah, well, there are about uh, 340 uh, workers there represented by the United Steelworkers. There's, uh, you know, dozens more managers. There's probably 100 contractors uh, on the site. So I spoke with uh, Union President uh, Glenn Nolan, and he predicts this closure could last anywhere from uh, two to five months. But of course, that all depends on uh, many factors uh, in, in the marketplace. And also, he says, workers were okay with this decision because there was already a lot of concern among the rank and file about the possible spread of the COVID-19 virus. So workers were okay to go home right now. And also, in the meantime, trucks will continue coming and going to the oil refinery and come by chance, uh, loading up on different types of fuels because I'm told there's already a, quite a substantial inventory of fuels uh, on hand in the massive tanks that are on site. Carolyn? Okay, thanks for this update, Terry. Well, the grocery store owner on the Northern Peninsula has closed shop for now over COVID-19 concerns. Chris Breen says he was alerted Saturday that a customer awaiting test results for COVID-19 shopped in his store. He says the shopper's parent told him about it. Breen alerted customers on social media and closed his store. He's also staying away from home and is sleeping at his business. A mail and parcel delivery is set to resume today in St. John's. The Kenmount Road facility was closed last week after five Canada Post employees tested positive for COVID-19. The facility has reopened, but Canada Post is operating with reduced staff. And some good news in Conception Bay North this weekend. A lottery surprise for 54 residents of Beta Verde. They all split a $1 million Atlantic lottery win. They all signed up to buy a Lotto Max ticket, so the prize will be split between them all. Each person will get about $18,500. Not too shabby. Stay with us. We'll be right back with the weather.
time to check in with Ashley in the weather forecast. And boy, Ashley, anyone who had to leave the house today, what a slippery first step uh, walking out the front door. There was so much ice on the ground and on everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had uh, lots of freezing rain yesterday overnight. And then again this morning, uh, if you were outside at all today, you basically needed a hard hat yeah. because of all that falling ice for sure uh, across, at least on the Avalon anyway. Now, as we head through the next couple of hours, or at least the night tonight, we're going to see that continue for uh, most of eastern Newfoundland, really. But temperatures today, we're hovering, uh, let's take a look at those numbers, we're hovering around the zero degree mark for most of eastern Newfoundland. And then as we head west, those temperatures are a little bit warmer, about three degrees for Cornerbrook, up through Labrador, mild as well, relatively speaking, one degree for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City seeing a high near four degrees today. Now, there's a, the areas of uh, freezing drizzle that I was talking about. There is some snow moving through central. And as we head through the night tonight, we're going to continue to see that. So normally we see systems move west to east, uh, weather moves west to east. But in the pattern that we're in right now, we're seeing the weather move east to west. So the area of snow is going to head towards the west coast as we head through the night tonight. Overall, uh, things should change over to some either freezing drizzle or drizzle with those temperatures hovering near and or around zero for most of eastern Newfoundland and central. This is the early morning hours. You can see we're going to eventually see that spread towards southeastern Labrador as well into the early morning hours. But again, with those temperatures hovering around the zero or one degree mark, uh, some snow could see about two to as much as five centimeters of snow and then transition through to either uh, some freezing drizzle or drizzle by the time the early morning rolls around. Now into tomorrow, temperatures climbing well above zero for the majority of us. So we should see things change over to rain tomorrow across the island. And in areas in southeastern Labrador, eventually spreading northwest, we're going to see that snow move for you. So you could see anywhere from 10 to as much as 15 centimeters in some of those higher elevations before we see a transition late day into uh, Wednesday morning for you into that snow and or freezing drizzle for southeastern portions of Labrador. So here's your temperatures, uh, two to as much as eight degrees for Corner Brook as we head into uh, the afternoon tomorrow. And again, you're gonna see some snow. Good chance we could see a few breaks in the cloud cover into the afternoon, but the first half of the day along the West Coast, you are looking at that potential for a few flurries. Uh, two degrees for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Lab City sitting at uh, four degrees. But overall, those winds will be light in the east and then progressively stronger as you head to the west. Now, uh, looking into Wednesday, we're going to see generally going to continue with the gray skies and the potential for some drizzle through the day as uh, that area of uh, rain and snow moves across Labrador. And behind it, though, again, we're looking at that onshore flow. So temperature is a little bit warmer again, uh, three to as much as eight degrees on the west coast one more time. And then Lab City, you're going to sit around two degrees and looking at that potential for snow. So just before we uh, leave you, I wanted to show you the first iceberg of the season. Ooh. Mark Gray captured that. What a great shot there, hey? Oh, that's Bottom fantastic. Vista. Leave it to Mark Gray to take a shot like that. So we Always. must be seeing the first icebergs now. That's it. That's the first iceberg of the season. A little early, too. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, <laughs> Ashley. Of course. Well, this time of self-isolation can be especially difficult for people who are already living in a stressful and dangerous domestic situation. So what supports are in place for people living with abusive partners? Joining me now is Laura Winters with the St. John Status of Women Council. So what kind of stories are you hearing from people who are calling your center in need of help? We're hearing from women who are reaching out, who are certainly living in circumstances of domestic violence. Some of them are calling, some of them are using other means to connect with us, which really shows the creativity, intelligence, and resourcefulness of women who do survive domestic violence. Um, we're hearing that the pressure's up, and I think that reflects what's going on across the country and around the world in terms of domestic violence in times of pandemic. So we know when there's economic stress, uh, when there's societal stress, that the rates of domestic violence increase. What kind of services does the center offer for people who are looking for help? 
So usually we offer groups as well as individual counseling. Right now, uh, those groups are on hold, of course, because we can't do those in person, but we're doing a great deal of individual support. And that's available Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 4.30. You just call 753-0220, or you can email reception at sjwomencenter.ca. Our Right Here Right Now uh, walking counseling program is now a call-in counseling program. That's available for all women in the community. If you're working at Tim's, if you're a mom who's staying home with your kids right now, if you're the chief medical officer, you can call us. It's for all women to talk about whatever they'd like. So I think sometimes counseling uh, sounds intimidating, but really what this is, is a supportive non-judgmental air. And that's available Tuesday from 12 to 7 and Wednesday from 12 to 5 at that same number, 753-0220. So we really want women to know that we're here to provide that individual support and that support is available to you. It's challenging because women can't walk through the doors, which is how we like to connect. Uh, so a lot of our connections are happening on the phone right now, through email. As I said, women who survive domestic violence are extremely resourceful and they're being resourceful in how they can contact us. Um, we, of course, are as always linking them with other supportive services like shelters, like the Iris Kirby House. So there is a network of support out there, which is what we want women to know. And it may be more challenging to reach out right now but we're here, so we, we want women to know that. Great. Laura Winters, thank you so much. It's good to remind people that there is help out there. Thank you. Well, let's take you back now to today's medical briefing. The province has seen its first death from COVID-19 and even more positive cases. Once again, Health Minister John Hagee had strong words for people who aren't following the distancing restrictions. Today is a sad milestone in the evolution of this pandemic in Newfoundland and Labrador. We really have to take it though as a wake up call. COVID-19 is not the simple flu. COVID-19 is a deadly virus. People have recovered, yes, and we wish those who have the disease at the moment uh, all our best for their recovery. I'm worried though, that when I look around outside, while a lot of people have obviously taken our orders and instructions and recommendations to heart that there are still people out there who really have not grasped the gravity of this situation. This is not a game. You need to stop looking for loopholes, ways to get round the recommendations and the orders that our Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, has put in place. What you do today will have repercussions. They may not come for a few days, they may not come for a couple of weeks, and they may not affect you directly, but they could affect uh, one of your children or a sibling or, or your parents. It is not a game. Looking around, it doesn't seem that common sense is very common in certain sectors. That needs to change. Premier has referenced shopping, for example. Shopping can now no longer be a family activity. Shopping has to be for things that are essential to keep your family and your household going week over week as this pandemic evolves. One person, one trip each week. Don't take your children with you unless there is really no alternative. And please don't let them lick the handles on the shopping cart. Create yourself a bubble of protection. Stay in it and don't burst anybody else's. Well, the bells rang out at the Zion United Church in Buren last evening to thank all of the essential workers still on the job during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was one of several events to honor frontline workers. After the break, we'll show you the big loud thank you at St. John's Harbor last evening.
the sound of gratitude in St. John's last evening. Many residents took part in a mass thank you to essential workers by making noise. Starting at 7 p.m., ships in the harbor blasted their horns and others joined in playing music and making lots of noise, all to say thank you to frontline workers. Lovely gesture. I hope the frontline workers got to hear some of it. That's it for us uh, this evening. Thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us tonight. Up next, it's the news from CBC Nova Scotia.